please turn to page 355 to Fixing the World. Fixing the world entails a never ending process of actions that contribute to the moral uplifting of society, such as building a home for the homeless and offering hope to the hopeless. Rooted in Jewish mysticism, acts of tikkun olam have a cosmic effect. They change the balance of good and evil in the universe. But the practice of tikkun olam does not stand alone. It is necessary, but not sufficient, to live up to the ethics of Judaism. Some of us may be so drawn to fixing the outside world that we ne neglect the inner world of our being. And so Jewish tradition offers us a partner to Tikkun Olam, a partner that has too often been neglected, the process of internal mending called Tikkun Midot. Whereas acts of Tikkun Olam are social and public, acts of Tikkun Midot are personal and private. As Tikkun Olam confronts the incompleteness and imperfection of the world around us, Tikkun Midot addresses the incompleteness and imperfection of our inner self. Tikkun Midot and Tikkun Olam are not mutually exclusive. They are mutually dependent and inexorably intertwined. Both are necessary to uplift the world. The moral whole is more than the sum of the moral parts. Spiritual awareness and social justice are two sides of the same coin. Tikkun Midot looks at the moral life from the inside out. Tikkun Olam approaches the same domain from the outside in. Tikkun Midot starts with me. Tikkun Olam starts with us. We continue on page 356. If you wish, please rise. You are the source of blessing, Adonai, our God, and God of our fathers and mothers, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob. 
God of Sarah, God of Rebecca, God of Rachel, and God of Leah. Exalted God, dynamic in power, inspiring awe. God sublime, creator of all. Yet you offer us kindness, recall the loving deeds of our fathers and mothers, and bring redemption to their children's children, and acting in love for the sake of your name. Remember us for life, sovereign God, who treasures life. Inscribe us in the book of life for your sake, God of life. Sovereign of salvation, pillar of protection. Baruch Adonai. Magain Avraham Vezrat Sarah. Blessed are you in our lives, Adonai, shield of Abraham, sustainer of Sarah. Please turn to the middle of page 362 to the quality of Guru Ra. The quality of Guru Ra may be understood as strength, justice, severity, discipline, and will. Reflecting on Guru Ra offers us an opportunity to contemplate the way in which we set limits for ourselves and the way we judge ourselves and others. Like many people, I tend to be quite hard on myself. Love and strength, chesed and Guru Ra, are partners when I keep them in balance with each other, allowing me to be both critical and kind to myself and others. Please turn to page 364. Atagibur le'olam Adonai, mechaye hakol atarav lehoshia, morid hatal. Mechakeh ha'chayim b'chesed, mechaye hakol b'rachamim rabim, sol mech noflim v'rofe holim, u'matir atzuri. Your life-giving power is forever, Adonai. With us in life and in death, you liberate and save, cause dew to descend, and with mercy abundant, lovingly nurture all life. From life to death, you are the force that flows without end. You support the falling, heal the sick, free the imprisoned and combined. You are faithful even to those who rest in the dust. Power beyond power, from whom salvation springs, sovereign over life and death, who is like you? Merciful God, who compares with you? With tender compassion, you remember all creatures of life, faithful and true, worthy of our trust. You sustain our immortal yearnings. In you, we place our undying hopes. Wellspring of blessing, power eternal, you are the one who gives and renews all life. Please turn to page 366. We read responsively. In the name of daybreak and the eyelids of morning and the wayfaring moon and the night when it departs. Please turn to page 368. No. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. We're not done yet. Okay. You have, to you have to unmute. Uh, you have to unmute. Or you're not unmuted. There we I go. I am now. Yep. 
I'll start over. I swear I will not dishonor my soul with hatred, but offer myself humbly as a guardian of nature, as a healer of misery, as a messenger of wonder, as an architect of peace. In the name of the sun and its mirrors and the day that embraces it and the cloud veils drawn over it and the utmost night and the male and the female and the plants bursting with seed and the crowning seasons of the firefly and the apple. I will honor all life when, wherever and in whatever form it may dwell on earth, my home, and in the mansions of the stars. Now, please turn to page 368. <laughs> sanctify your name in the world as celestial song sanctifies you in realms beyond our world. In the words of your prophet, holy, holy, holy is God of heaven's hosts. The fullness of the whole earth is God's glory. God of strength who gives us strength. God of might who gives us might. How magnificent the signs of your being throughout the earth. Blessed is the God of eternity who comes forth in splendor. Our God is one. Avino and Malkenu, sovereign source of life and liberation, revealing with mercy to all who live. I am Adonai, your God. Please turn to page 370. <laughs> The eternal shall reign for all time, your God for all generations, Zion, hallelujah. We will teach your greatness, Lador Vador, from generation to generation. And to the end of time, we will affirm your holiness. Our God, your praise shall ever be on our lips, for your power is boundless, sovereign, and holy. We'll continue in the middle of page 371 with the second reading, Ethical Will. Judaism, my child, is the struggle to bring God down to earth, a struggle for the sanctification of the human heart. This struggle your people wages not with physical force, but with spirit, with sincere heartfelt prayers, and by constant striving for peace and justice. So do you understand, my child, how we are distinct from others and wherein lies the secret of our existence on earth? Knowing this, will your heart be, still be heavy, my child? Will you still say you cannot stand your fate? But you must, my child, for so were you commanded. It is your calling, this is your mission, your purpose on earth. You must go to work alongside people of other nations and you will teach them that they must come to a brotherhood of nations 
and to a union of all nations with God. You may ask, how does one speak to them? This is how. Thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not covet, love thy neighbor as thyself. Do these things, and through their merit, my child, you will be victorious. Please turn to page 373, The Gift of Awe. Let us read responsively. Come to the woods, for here is rest. There is no repose like that of the deep green woods. The clearest way into the universe is through a forest wilderness. The winds will blow their own freshness into you and the storms their energy, while cares will drop off like autumn leaves. As age comes on, one source of enjoyment after another is closed, but nature's sources never fail. The poetry of birth is never dead. Study nature, love nature, stay close to nature. It will never fail you. Nature is the living, visible garment of God. Nature never hurries. Atom by atom, little by little, she achieves her work. What seems to be a stone is a drama. The joy of looking and comprehending is nature's most beautiful gift. When I behold your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and stars that you set in place. Replete is the world with a spiritual radiance, replete with sublime and marvelous secrets but a small hand held against the eye hides it all. The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky proclaims God's handiwork. What we lack is not a will to believe, but a will to wonder. Please turn to page 376. We read the English together. And so in your holiness, give the righteous the gift of a vision bright with joy, a world where evil has no voice, and the rule of malevolence fades like wisps of smoke. Good people everywhere will celebrate this will celebrate the stunning sight of arrogance gone from the earth. Please turn to page 390. God of our fathers and mothers, lead us to holiness through your mitzvot, and may each of us find a portion of Torah that is ours. You bestow such goodness, teach us to be satisfied, and to know the joy of your salvation. Make your hearts pure so that we may be of true service to you, for you are the forgiver of Israel, in every generation granting pardon to the tribes of Yeshurun. 
We have no God of forgiveness and pardon but you, you alone. Please turn to page 392 and go to the middle of the page. My heart, homeland, is with your dews. At night on fields of bramble and to the cypresses scent and moist thistle, I will extend a hidden wing. Your paths are soft cradles of sand stretching between the acacia hedges, as though on a surface of pure silk, I'll move forward, I'll move forever upon them, held by some unfathomable charm, and transparent skies whisper over the dark, a frozen sea of trees. Please turn to page 394. <laughs> Together on page 394. Eternal our God, your people Israel yearns for your favor. Receive their prayer with loving acceptance, and may you always desire your people's worship. Divine one, close to all who call upon you, bring your grace and presence near to those who serve you. Pour forth your spirit on us, and may our eyes see your merciful return to Zion. Baruch atah Adonai, hamachazir shinato litzion. Blessed are you whose divine presence is felt again in Zion. Please turn to page 397 and let us reflect on the questions at the bottom of the page.
Please turn to page 398. God who is ours, God of all generations, to you we are grateful forever. Rock and protector of our lives, your saving power endures from age to age. We thank you and tell the tale of your praise, your power in our lives, your caring for our souls, the constant miracle of your kindness. Morning, noon, and night we call you goodness for your compassion never ends. We call you mercy, for your love has no limit. We call you hope now and for all time. Please turn to page 407 and go to the middle of the page to our sages teach. Our sages teach, humility is the pathway to peace. Strive to purify yourself of jealousy, resentment, and competition for honor. These lead to argument and strife between people. A quiet, contented spirit rooted in gratitude for what we possess will be at peace. Thus, after our prayer for peace, we ask, before all human beings, let humility be my stance. Please turn to page 406. of seem shalom together. Let there be peace, grant goodness, blessing, and grace, constancy, and compassion to us and all Israel, your people. 
Avinu, bless and unite all human beings in the light of your presence, for your light has shown us a holy path for living. Devotion to love, generosity, blessedness, mercy, life, and peace. In your goodness, bless your people Israel with peace at all times. Let us and the whole family of Israel be remembered and, and inscribed in the book of life. May it be a life of goodness, blessing, and prosperity. May it be a life of peace. Baruch atah Adonai Osei HaShalom. You are the blessed one, eternal source of shalom. Please turn to page 408. Let us pray together silently. to page 410, where we will continue to sing together Ose Shalom.
Um, Lenore, you're muted. May the maker of peace above make peace for us, all Israel and all who dwell on earth. Amen. Please turn to page 273 to the middle of the page for the Misha Berach. turn to page 342 for the blessings before the Haftarah, the blessing. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech olam asher bacha l'nvi'im tovim Viratsa vidivrehem hainem arim emet Baruch Adonai Habocher batorah Uv Moshe avdo Uv Yisrael amo Uv invie Ha'emet fat sedek. And the word of Adonai came to Jonah, son of Amittai, get up, go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim against it, for their evil deeds have risen up before me. But Jonah got up to flee to Tashish, away from the presence of Adonai, and he went down to Jaffa and found there a ship heading for Tashish. And he paid its fare and went down into it to head with them to Tashish, away from the presence of Adonai. But Adonai hurled a great wind upon the sea, a storm at sea so great the ship was in danger of being shattered to pieces and the sailors were frightened cried out each to his own God and flung the ship's cargo into the sea to lighten their load. But Jonah had gone down into the hole, the lower deck of the vessel, and he laid down and fell into a deep sleep. And the captain approached him and said to him, why are you doing sound asleep? Get up, call to your God, Perhaps the God will be kind to us and we will not perish. And they said, each man to his companion, let us cast lots that we might know on whose account this evil event has come to us. 
So they cast lots, and the lots fell on Jonah. And they said to him, tell us you who have brought this evil upon us, what is your trade and where have you come from? What is your country and who are your people? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew. I revere Adonai, God of heaven, who has made sea and dry land. The men felt great fear and they asked him, what have you done? because the man knew he was fleeing from Adonai, for so he had told them. And they asked him, what should we do to you to bring calm to the sea around us? For the sea was growing more and more stormy. So he said to them, lift me up and hurl me into the sea and the sea will come down for you. For I know that this great storm came upon you because of me. And the crew rode hard to return to dry land but they could not do, do it, for the sea was raging more and more fiercely around them. And they called out to Adonai, say, please, Adonai, please do not let us perish because of the life of this man. And do not hold us guilty of shedding innocent blood. For you, Adonai, that which you've desired, you have brought about. And they lifted Jonah and hurled him into the sea. The, then the sea stopped raging. The men revered Adonai great. Great was their reverence. So they offered to Adonai a sacrifice and made vows. And Adonai provided a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Jonah prayed to Adonai, his God, from the belly of the fish. And he said, I called to Adonai in my dreams, and God answered me. I cried out from the belly of the netherworld, and you heard my voice. Into the depths you cast me, into the heart of the sea, and the floods engulfed me. All your billowing, breaking waves swept over me. And I thought to myself, I was banished from before your eyes while I ever gaze upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me, the deep engulfed me, rushes wrapped around my head. I descended to the low point of the mountains. The gates of the earth closed upon me forever. Yet you, I don't know, my God, raised my life from the pit. When my life fainted away, I called I don't know, to mind, and my prayer came to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to employ, to empty folly, forsake their own welfare. But I, with a shout of thanksgiving, I will sacrifice to you what I vowed I will fulfill. Rescue comes from Adonai. Adonai commanded the fish and it spewed Jonah out upon dry land. And the word of Adonai came to Jonah a second time. Get up, go to the great city of Nineveh and call out to it the proclamation that I tell you. So Jonah got up and went to Nineveh according to the word of Adonai. Now Nineveh was a great city of God, three days journey across. And J Jonah started out and made his way into the city, the distance of one day walk. And he called out and said, 40 more days and Nineveh shall be overturned. The people of Nineveh trusted in God and they proclaimed a fast and they put on a sackcloth from the richest to the poorest and word reached the king of Nineveh and he got up from his throne, took off his robe, put on sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he cried out and said in Nineveh, by decree of the king and his nobles, no person or beef, beast or flock or herd shall taste anything. They shall not graze. They shall not drink water. They shall be covered with sackcloth, person and beast, and shall call loudly to God. Let all turn back from their evil ways and from the violence which is in their hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent, turn back from the heart of anger so that we do not perish. And God saw what they did, 
how they were turning back from their evil ways. And God relented from the evil claimed for them and did not carry it out. But, jo but to Jonah, this was a great evil and it made him angry. So he played to Adonai saying, please Adonai, is this not what I said when I was still in my own country? This is why I fled to Tarshish to begin with. For I knew that you are glorious, that we are gracious and compassionate God, endlessly patient and abounding in steadfast love, ready to repent of evil. And now, Adonai, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And Adonai said, it is good for you to be angry. Then Jonah left the city, found the place east of the city, made himself a shelter there, and sat under it in the shade until he might see what would become of the city. And Adonai Elohim provided a gourd and, and made it rise up over Jonah to give shade for his head and rescue him from the evil situation. And Jonah rejoiced with great joy because of the gourd. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm that attacked the gourd and it withered. And as the sun rose, God provided an oppressive wind from the east. And the sun beat down on Jonah, Jonah's head, making him faint. He begged for death saying, it is better for me to die than to live. Then God said to Jonah, are you good and angry about the gourd? And he said, I am good and angry to the point of death. Then I don't know, he said, you pity the gourd, which you neither worked for nor grew, which appeared overnight and perished overnight. Should I then not have compassion for the great city of Nineveh, a place of more than 120,000 human beings, unable to tell their right hand from their left and many beasts. Please turn to page 351 for the blessings after the Haftorah. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech alam, sur kol ha'olamim, sadik b'chol ha'derot, ho'el ha'nemon, ho'amer v'yaseh, ha'mdaber m'kayim, shakol derav, divarav emet v'atzedek, al ha'torah v'al ha'avodah v'al ha'nbeim v'al yom ha'kipurim ha'zeh, Shanatata lanu Adonai Eloheinu, lin chila valis licha ucha para, licha vodal tifaret, al hakol Adonai Eloheinu, anachnu modim la chum barachim otach, yet barach shim chabe fi kal chayet ani lolam vaed, ud baracha emet bekayam baad, baruchata Adonai, melech mochel besoleach, Avonotenu Vilavo no Ramo Bet Yisrael, Uma Virish Motenu, Bechoshana Bishana, Melcha Kaharet, Mekadesh Yisrael, Viom Hakipurim. Okay, everybody, um, we're now going to have uh, a discussion. Um, and I thought in these times that we should look back on somebody who was a prophet. Um, in, in a struggle that we had 50 years ago. And I'll start uh, by putting his picture up and see if anybody uh, can, uh, can, can recognize him. So, okay, um, the fellow with, with the arrow on top of his head, does anybody know who this is? And, and I'd ask everybody, you know, feel free to unmute yourself if you want to uh, hop in. Abraham, um, what is this, Abraham? Yeah, Abraham Joshua Heschel, very good. And um, Mel, do you know where this picture is taken from for bonus points? No. I'm guessing Selma, but I really don't yeah. know. Bingo. This was uh, the March on Selma. Uh, this was going back to the history of the Voting Rights Act. And um, you may uh, remember that uh, first the civil rights uh, marchers went over the Edmund Pettus Bridge, they were stopped. Uh, then President Johnson announced that we will overcome. And then they marched from Selma to Birmingham. And that is 
Abraham Joshua Heschel. He had a lot to say about prophecy and a little bit to say about Jonah. And that's where we're going to go today. So I'm going to start. He wrote a book about the prophets. Um, I'd like someone please to um, read this passage from me. The words of the prophet are stern, sour, stinging, but behind his austerity is love and compassion for <clears throat> mankind. Ezekiel sets forth what all other prophets imply. Have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, says the Lord God, and not rather that he should return from his way and live? He begins with a message of doom. He concludes with a message of hope. Okay, very good. Thank you, Alan. So, um, you know, what, um, what Heschel had in mind was, you know, the classic prophets. And actually, uh, we, we heard from one of them this morning, Cantor Judy sung it beautifully in the Hebrew. But just to, um, just to remind us of that, I'd like uh, someone to turn back to page 277 of the prayer book and um, uh, read, uh, this is from Isaiah. And I'd like someone please to read verses um, one through uh, eight. Cry from the depth, says God, do not hold back. Lift up your voice like the shofar. Tell my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sin. Yes, they seek me daily as though eager to learn my ways, as if they were a nation that does, that does what is right and has not abandoned God's law. They ask of me the right way, eager for God's nearness. They say, why did we fast and you did not see it? We afflict ourselves and you did not know it. Because even on your fast day, you think only of desire while oppressing all who work for you. Because your fasting is filled with strife and with callous fists you strike. No, your fasting this day will not lift up your voice before heaven. Is this the fast I desire, a day to afflict body and soul, bowing your head like a reed, covering yourself with sackcloth and ashes? Do you call this a fast, a day worthy of the favor of Adonai? Is not this the fast I desire, to break the bonds of injustice and to remove the heavy yoke, to let the oppressed go free and release all those enslaved? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and to take home the homeless poor into your home and never to neglect your own flesh and blood? Then shall your light burst forth like the dawn and your wounds shall quickly heal, your righteous one leading the way before you, the presence of Adonai guarding you from behind. Okay, so there you have your classic prophecy. You start with the message of doom, you end with the message of hope. So what is Jonah's prophecy here? What does he say? It's just Nineveh, five words. That Nineveh said, will be overthrown. Okay, that's uh, overturned. Yeah, that's all he says. So it's not exactly, it's not exactly a message of hope. Um, so, you know, of course, the rabbis have to work on this, and um, Rashi comes up with a, a, good, a good explanation. Oops, that's the wrong screen. Okay, so this is what Rashi says. Can anyone, can I get a volunteer, please, to read Rashi? Nepachet overturned. Jonah warns the people that Nineveh will be overturned. The text does not simply use the word destroyed because the word overturned can be used in two... Oh, I just lost. Ah, the words overturned um, can be used in two different ways, bad and good. If they do not repent, the Nineveh will be overturned. If they do repent, then that which was proclaimed concerning the people of Nineveh, Nineveh will be overturned, for they turn over from bad to good and repented. See, so what, what Rashi did is he said, well, you look at the word overturn, you can use it in different ways, and therefore what sounds like a message of doom uh, can also be interpreted as a message of hope. And... Um, uh, the, the question is, what did Jonah think about this? And um, 
we go back to um, we go back to Jonah's original choice to go to, to Tarshish, and we have a map here that shows you exactly what was going on. Uh, God had asked Jonah to go to Nineveh, which you can see is to the northeast, and Jonah went in the exact opposite direction. He was basically going to Spain. And uh, the question is, um, why, um, uh, why was Jonah uh, not moved to uh, give this message of uh, hope or doom and hope to the Ninevites? Any, anyone want to take a shot at that? Sam? Yeah. <laughs> He seems almost to think that it's pointless. It, it's pointless to give the message because he believes that God is just going to do it anyway. It's 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 almost like it's not worth his time. Okay, so one th one theory is that Jonah was focused on the doom, and he thought he was going to deliver the doom, and uh, that was going to be it. Um, so he didn't. He he figured, why why bother? So that's that's one theory. Any other theories as to why Jonah chose to go in the opposite direction? I think it's the opposite. I think he found that uh, God always delivers messages. There's always a message of doom, but in the end, God is merciful and and saves them. And so, what's the point in delivering the message of doom when, in the end, God is going to be merciful and and uh, save them? Why is he wasting his time giving the message? Yeah, very, very good, Alan. So see what, um, what Alan's saying, or, or with your permission, I'll try extending you, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, it, Alan, um, Alan's suggesting that God wanted a prophet to do uh, what Heschel was saying, deliver the message of doom combined with a chance of hope. And, and actually Jonah didn't like that. And that's why um, he, went, he went the other way. Um, well, I have a question, though. If if it's clear that Jonah was, doesn't want to be the, the messenger that God wants him to be, why did God stick with him? Why did God just find a different messenger? Um, well, that's uh, that, that's a good question. Um, and, and hold on to that, because we'll, we'll get, get to that a little bit later. Um, so um, continuing on um, with... Um, uh, with uh, Heschel's description of the ideal prophet. And actually, this will pick up um, a little bit, Lauren, on your point. Um, uh, can I have a volunteer to read? This is also from Heschel's book about the prophets. I will. The prophet is no hireling who performs his duty in the employ of the Lord. The fundamental experience of the prophet is a fellowship with the feelings of God, a sympathy with the divine pathos. The emotional experience of the prophet becomes the focal point of the prophet's understanding of God. He lives not, not only his personal life, but also the life of God. The prophet hears God's voice and feels his heart. As an imparter, his soul overflows, speaking as he does out of the fullness of his sympathy. Okay, so again... Going back to Isaiah, the formula works perfectly. We, we, uh, Isaiah delivers this uh, inspiring message about how uh, we should uh, not offer vain sacrifices. We instead should live a, a life of justice. But my question is, how about Jonah? How emotionally is he involved in the message that he was assigned to give to the Ninevites? Um, I think that that um, Jonah was more judgmental, that he, he basically wanted um, the Ninevites to be punished, that he was not willing to show mercy, to have the sympathy. And so because he didn't want to um, follow through with that, with God's will, he ran away. Very good, Laura. So actually, that's going to take us to the next part of Heschel, where he talks about Jonah and what was what was what Heschel thinks Jonah was uh, thinking at the time. And, and Laura, if you could follow up and read that for us, please. God's change of mind displeased Jonah exceedingly. He had proclaimed the doom of Nineveh with a certainty, to the point of fixing the time as an inexorable decree without qualification. 
But what transpired only proved the word of God was neither firm nor reliable. For a prophet who stakes his life on the reliability and infallibility of the word of God, such realization leads to despair. O oh Lord, take my life from me, I beseech thee, for it is better for me to die than to live, was his prayer. Okay, so um, why is, why is uh, Jonah uh, so focused on um, uh, 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 God's uh, word being absolutely true no matter what? Well, here's, here's, a, here's a clue um, for the Hebrew scholars out there. Um, Jonah's name is Jonah ben Amitai. Does the word Amitai um, sound similar to any Hebrew words you know about? Okay, here's the lifeline. A anyone know the Hebrew word emet? Truth. Truth. Okay. Truth. So, um, uh, what, um, what Jonah might be focused on is that he thinks he's got to deliver the true word. And if what he says is not true, then he is a bad prophet. Um, but if you remember, um, going back to um, what Heschel said about Ezekiel, um, Ezekiel says um, that uh, the prophet doesn't have any pleasure in the death of the wicked. And he begins with a message of doom and concludes with a message of hope. So basically, uh, Jonah does not pass the Heschel test for being a good, uh, being a good prophet. So um, the question is, you know, once uh, Jonah says to, to expresses his displeasure to God um, and God responds, what, what is God trying to teach Jonah and teach us? in the message he gives to Jonah. I think there are a couple of things. One is that we are responsible to our community um, for Tikkun Olam to help them, but also to have mercy, to have forgiveness, to recognize that we can, we can change. And Jonah, it's very good at holding anger. I mean, from a psychological point of view, it's really unhealthy. Yeah. So, so Laura, once again, you have channeled Rabbi Heschel. Um, and I'd ask you please to read uh, this passage from his book uh, from the prof about the prophets. God's answer to Jonah, stressing the supremacy of compassion, upsets the possibility of looking for a rational coherence of God's ways with the world. History would be more intelligible if God's word was the last word, final and unambiguous, like a dogma or an unconditional decree, it would be easier if God's anger became effective automatically. Once wickedness had reached its full measure, punishment would destroy it. Yet be beyond justice and anger lies the mystery of compassion. Okay. So now we're going to, we're going to jump up to the 1960s. Uh, Heschel finished this book in 1962, and he met Martin Luther King at a uh, religious conference in 1963. And later on, he talked about how he formed a bond with King. It was over the story of Moses. And, and Heschel also became a protester in the Vietnam War. Uh, so I'd like someone to uh, uh, read this section, in which Heschel talks about how his study of the prophets led to his civil rights work. I'll read it. The third event that changed my attitude was my study of the prophets of ancient Israel, a study on which I worked for several years until its publication in 1962. The more deeply immersed I came in the thinking of the prophets, the more powerfully it became clear to me what the lives of the prophets sought to convey, that morally speaking, there is no limit to the concern one must feel for the suffering of human beings. It also became clear to me that in regard to cruelties committed in the name of a free society, some are guilty while all are responsible. I did not feel guilty as an individual American for the bloodshed in Vietnam, but I felt deeply responsible. And so I decided to change my mode of living and to become active in the cause of peace in Vietnam. Okay, 
So this passage contains one of Heschel's biggest insights, um, where he says, um, uh, some are guilty while all are responsible. And my question is, does that resonate um, uh, for anybody with some of the issues that we're facing today um, in America? Sure, we have, we have collective responsibility, if not collective guilt in, in, our, in our ways of dealing with this and our ways of dealing with each other. Sure, I mean, it, it just, I, I think it, it, it really uh, echoes the discussion about racism right now. Are you a racist? And um, uh, the, the reaction by a lot of people is, well, I have not engaged in pre prejudice, therefore I am not a racist. And then what you hear on the other side is, well, you are part of a, uh, uh, a society which has systemic racism. And unless you step forward and help address it, then you are part of the problem. And, and so I, I think that Heschel's message um, uh, resonates today. Um, we're short on time. But there's one last passage from Heschel uh, I'd, like, I'd like for us to read, which I think ties it all together. If I can have a, a volunteer uh, to read in very stirring terms, it's this page and the next page. The question about Auschwitz to be asked is not where was God, but rather where was man? The God of Abraham has never promised always to hold back Cain's hand from killing his brother. To equate God in history is idolatry. God is present when man's heart is alive. When the heart turns to stone, when man is absent, God is banished and history disengaged is distress. What should have been humanity's answer to the Nazi atrocities? Repentance, a revival of the conscience, a sense of unceasing burning shame a persistent effort to be worthy of the name human, to prevent the justification of the death of man theology, to control the urge to cruelty. It is not a desecration of our commitment to act as if that agony never happened, to go on with religion as usual at a time when nuclear disaster is being made a serious possibility. Jonah is running from Tarshish, running to Tarshish, while Nineveh is tottering on the brink. Are we not all guilty of Jonah's failure? We have been running to Tarshish when the call is to go to Nineveh. Okay, so um, that, um, that I would offer as um, our message for today. There's a lot going on. Um, but if you hear the call to go to Nineveh, don't go to Char Tarshish, answer the call. I wish Rabbi Heschel were here to inspire us uh, today, um, but uh, he gave an example of what we could do, and he used the story of Jonah to teach it to us. So I thought it was something that would be very interesting uh, to talk about, and uh, thank you all for uh, it, helping with this discussion. Please turn to page 425 to recognizing the good. We will read responsibly. Recognizing the good. What gives us, what gives us strength to pursue goodness? Awareness of the good that is around us, decent, generous acts the remind us of what is possible here and now in this world of moral ambiguity. So our sages taught one mitzvah inspires another. Thus we acknowledge and celebrate. Those who do their job best on the job, whatever their level or pay. And those who run an honest business, who don't cut corners, falsify or lie. Those who labor, labor in obscurity to help others or advance the frontiers of truth, those who add beauty to the world through the arts or through unselfish deeds. Patient teachers who see the potential in shy or difficult students, students who focus on learning, not just good marks and earn their grade fairly without cheating. Athletes who exemplify good sportsmanship and self-discipline, 
all those who use their wealth to benefit society and the greater good. Those in high places who resist the corruption of power, whistleblowers alert to malfeasance who bravely sound the alarm. Public servants who do the people's business with integrity, politicians who place conscience above popularity. Those who travel far from home to defend our country from foes. Those who keep our community safe, who run into fires to save lives. Parents who care selflessly for ill or troubled children. Children who give time and love to frail and aging parents. Loving spouses who remain faithful. Loyal friends who stand fast in times of trouble. May their mitzvot inspire our own. May we find the strength to emulate their honor. Let us take joy in remembering that goodness still abides. Please turn to page 429. Let us sing the last stanza of Avinu Malkenu together. Avinu Malkenu, Avinu. At this point in the service, we will have a silent meditation. Today you are invited to a guided meditation. I will describe a journey that you make in your imagination, a journey which may help you to think about Yom Kippur in a way that is particularly meaningful to you. In a guided meditation, you may listen with your eyes open or with your eyes closed. Having eyes closed may help you visualize easier, but it is not required. If you leave your eyes open, you may find it helpful to choose a focus point, like the floor or a wall in front of you, to reduce your distractions around the room. I will be describing a journey for you to imagine in your mind's eye. In the middle of this journey, there will be a minute of silence when you will be invited to meditate quietly on whatever is meaningful to you at that time. And then I will begin to describe to you again the journey that returns each of us to the place where we began. Take a moment to relax. Notice your breathing. Allow your cares and worries and distractions of everyday life to fade into the background. As you do this, you will begin to notice a path, a path that will lead you to a place where you can meditate on what Yom Kippur means to you. Imagine a path that you can follow easily, a path that takes you on a calm, reflective journey into a deeper understanding of this Day of Atonement and what it signifies for you. As you travel along this path, you will find yourself gradually becoming more relaxed, more calm, more centered. Notice the path. Notice how it feels to move along in the direction of a deeper calm and clarity. Soon you will come to a place where you would like to linger for a while, a place of quiet contemplation. 
This is your personal spot where you can reflect on everything we have been doing today. All the prayers, the music, the discussion. This is a place where clarity and insight will flourish. Here you can reflect on what the past year has been like for you. Here you can consider what you would like to do differently in the coming year. Notice whatever comes to you in whatever form it may take. If the image is not clear at this time, just appreciate the opportunity to be here quietly with your thoughts. I will pause now for a minute of silent meditation. When you hear my voice again, I will be guiding you towards the completion of the meditation. And now with your eyes still closed, you may begin to travel back on the path that brought you here. You will take with you a clearer sense of the changes you want to make in the coming year. You may experience yourselves leaving behind some ways of acting and thinking that you no longer wish to carry with you into the new year. Notice how you feel as you retrace your steps along the path. Gradually, you can bring your full attention back to where you are, where you are sitting. You may open your eyes and feel refreshed and inspired. Okay, well, that um, concludes our service. Once again, thank you all. Uh, for contributing to this year's uh, lively experiment. Um, please join me in thanking our committee for putting this service together. Uh, they are Gloria Feibish, Lenore Piper, Mark Schneider, Laura Mason Seisler, and Lauren Zurier. Please also join us in extending a Toda Raba to Zach and Joey Magnon for their beautiful musical contribution and to Mel Blake for his stirring reading of the book of Jonah. We also wish to thank by Cantor Judy and Rabbi Sarah for their moral support and wisdom, and Judy Mosley for running the controls so seamlessly. We wish everybody an, a, an easy fast and a Shana Tobah.